video is the format is the usual in a sense we're gonna have 40 minutes of talk and then five minutes of discussion by Daniele Condorelli from Borwick University and then uh, for 15 minutes of informal chat. Thank you Emilio and uh, thank you for the invitation today uh, it's great to be here and I'm happy to present uh, my paper called Equivalence in Business Models for Informational Intermediaries. Can everyone hear me good? Okay, so now let me start with uh, some motivation and a little bit of background story uh, of, of what this paper is going to be about. Um, for the past one or two decades maybe, platform economics uh, has become popular. That's probably part of the reason why we're having this seminar today. And uh, a specific feature of platforms is that uh, they help sellers or producers of a product displaying their goods to potential buyers. Classical examples include Amazon or eBay, if you think about the uh, platforms in the internet age, or uh, you can think about platforms in a more traditional format such as QVC, uh, which is a broadcasting channel that uh, allows sellers to go on the channel and uh, display their products and make advertisements. One important thing about this platform is that they are able to provide information about the products to the consumers, uh, which is otherwise uh, difficult for the consumers to acquire or for the sellers to provide by themselves. Uh, if you go on Amazon as a consumer, you can easily see the picture of the product. You can easily see the review. You can see all sorts of details of a product, uh, which is otherwise difficult for you to figure out if you don't go on Amazon and just interact with the uh, seller remotely. Okay, and these platforms have this technology and therefore they can profit from it. In other words, uh, the... Uh, this paper is going to study uh, a, an economic interaction where the platforms have the information technology and that can uh, help the sellers inform the buyers about the product. And plus that there are many ways for these platforms to operate. A, a running example throughout the paper uh, is going to be Amazon. And Amazon operates under two major business models. One is the so-called Amazon Vendor Central, where Amazon acts as a retailer or a middleman uh, who buys the product first from producers or sellers and then sells the product directly using its own platform or website to the consumers. And in the meantime, providing whatever information that's suitable for, for itself. On the other hand, the seller central business model is the one in which Amazon acts just as a third party uh, who only provides the space or the website or just a, uh, a place for sellers to display their products and help the sellers provide information and has nothing to do with how the transaction is made. In particular, in the seller central model, Amazon doesn't dictate market price or the product prices. It is the seller who eventually sets the product price. And because there are many business models to operate, a natural question arises, which is, which, which business model is better? Which business model is more profitable for a platform? Which business model is uh, better for consumers? Which business model is better for sellers? And which business model is better for the economy? So in this paper, I'm going to study this kind of question. And the main result of the paper is actually that, well, in some cases, business models don't actually matter. I'm going to, the main result is going to be that all the business models are going to be outcome equivalent if and only if some virtual markups are large enough. And I'll be more precise about what this virtual markups mean. Uh, basically, you can think of virtual, virtual markups as an, a decreasing function of the seller's information rent or an increasing function of the demand elasticity of the market. Okay, so that's the, that's the motivation. And now I'm going to jump into the model. Uh, the model is relatively straightforward. Um, there's one product, one buyer, one seller, and one intermediary. 
The buyer has a unit demand and a value V where V belongs to a compact interval, cap V, uh, that's not negative. And let me let this uh, D naught of P denote the distribution of that value. So that D naught of P is the probability that a value P is above, uh, the value V is above a price P. So we can think of D naught also as the uh, demand function induced by this probability distribution. On the other hand, the seller has marginal cost, C, that belongs to another compact interval. It follows the common prior G, where G has a density, little g, that's everywhere positive. Now let me let CG denote the usual virtual cost function as a cost plus an information rate, okay? And let me assume for this talk only, if this is just for simplicity, that uh, CG is increasing so that G is regular, and D naught induces a decreasing marginal revenue curve. Uh, in other words, D naught is regular in the Myersonian sense as well. Okay, so uh, that's the primitive of the model. Now going to the information. Uh, the buyer doesn't necessarily know what V is exactly. The buyer has to learn about V through a signal. A signal is formally a transition probability that maps from true value to a distribution over values. In other words, a signal is a Blackwell experiment that maps from the state space, which in this model, uh, the buyer's true value, to a distribution over signal realizations. Now, because the buyer eventually is only going to make a binary decision of whether or not to buy the good, it is without loss to assume that the signal space equals the state space, which is V here. Some examples, we can have full information fully revealing the buyer's true value to the buyer so that for every V, pi of V is a direct measure that puts probability one on V. Or we can have a signal that's not informative at all. So pi of V is a direct measure that puts probability one on the expected value of V for all V. Or we can have partial disclosure so that for any V, if V is a below a threshold V star, pi of V is a direct measure that puts probability one uh, uh, on V lower bar. If, if V is above a threshold V star, then pi is a direct measure that puts probability one on another, uh, another variable V upper bar. Okay, and these are just examples. I'm allowing for uh, all kinds of possible signals, which is the trans transition probability of this form. Okay, now given a signal and a true value V, uh, the buyer is going to observe privately the signal realization that is drawn from pi of V. And then the buyer is going to update via base rule before he makes a purchase in decision. Now the price is going to be determined by the mechanism and business models, which I'll explain later. But at the time when the buyer makes a purchase in decision, he already updated after receiving this private signal realization. So for a buyer, he's going to decide whether or not to buy the product at some price based on his posterior. Now, a, a good feature, a nice feature of this model is that the buyer has unit, uh, unit demand and therefore only the interim expected value matters for, for all the information that's relevant. So we only have to keep track of the buyer's interim expected value which is here. Given a signal realization S, the buyer will form expected value. Uh, that's the expected value of V conditional S. Okay. Let me let D pi denote the distribution of this interim expected value. This interim expected value is itself a random variable because S itself is drawn from a, a distribution pi of V. So there is a marginal distribution of this random variable. And I'm denoting this marginal distribution as d pi. Of course, we know from the law of iterated expectation, the expectation of this interim expected value equals to the ex ante expected value. This implies that d pi is a mean preserving contraction of the prior d naught. Conversely, that's also true. For any mean preserving contraction d of d naught, there exists a signal pi such that the induced distribution of interim expected value equals to D. Uh, 
okay? And this observation means that we can just represent the entire set of signal, which is quite large here, it's the set of transition probabilities by just a collection of mean preserving contractions of the prior. Let me formally write that down. Uh, before that, I move this up. Formally writing down the uh, collection of mean preserving contractions of the prior. So script D naught is the collection of non-increasing upper semi-continuous functions such that the following integral inequality holds. At all P, that's now negative, and with equality at P equals to zero. Now, this is just a classical uh, rot style, Stiglitz style representation of mean preserving contraction condition. And it says that any function, non-increasing non function D satisfying this integral inequality is a mean preserving contraction of D naught. So now I can replace uh, this long sentence by just the notation script D naught, and I can replace the definition of a signal by just sum D in D naught. Now this representation is convenient because remember I started with uh, tracing the marginal distribution of the interim expected value, and then represent the entire signal by just that distribution. This means that for any signal now called D in script D naught, it summarizes the distribution of the buyer's interim expected value. And because the way that I'm defining D, D of P is the probability that the buyer has an interim expected value that's above price P. So a signal is also itself a demand of the buyer under that signal. So now I'm using the buyer's demand to represent uh, the buyer's signal. And where does, this, where does the signal come from? Well, it comes from the intermediary. So now let me turn to the intermediary side of the model. The intermediary can operate under different business models as motivated in the introduction. And for, for the majority of this talk, I'm going to focus on two major business models. Um, and in, in the end, I can talk a little bit about how to, how to generalize it and, and how to think of uh, this result that involves only two business models. The first business model I'm going to consider is what I call the strong contracting model. And that uh, corresponds to Amazon's vendor central model that we just saw in the introduction. In this business model, the intermediary is able to contract with the seller on every aspect of the market, including the information that's going to be provided to the buyer, the price that's going to be charged to the buyer, and the amount of money that the intermediary, uh, that the seller would have to pay to the intermediary in exchange of the service. So uh, the revelation principle applies here, and therefore a mechanism, uh, we can just look at the direct mechanism that asks the seller to report her cost, so that given each report, say C, a mechanism specifies D of C, which is a signal that's going to be provided to the buyer, gamma of C, which is the distribution over price from which the seller would have to draw when selling the good to the buyer, and tau of C, which is the amount of money that the seller would have to pay to the intermediary. And as usual, uh, we can write down the IC and IR constraint in this environment, IC means that a mechanism would induce truthful report, and IR means that every truthfully reporting seller earns at least her outside option, which is zero in this case. Um, to read this IC condition, let's start from the right-hand side. The right-hand side of this inequality is the net profit of a seller whose true cost is C, and when she reports C prime, because she would have to pay tau C prime to the intermediary and the mechanism is going to generate a signal D of C prime, and the seller would have to sell the product according to the distribution of price gamma of C prime. So this, then this inequality says that uh, the seller wouldn't want to misreport. And same for the IR constraint, okay? So that's the strong contracting model. I mean, keep the mechanism here as a reminder. Uh, one so, thing, Kai, quick question. Are you assuming yeah. throughout that uh, there is full commitment? So Amazon can commit to a mechanism and is this reasonable for all sellers operating through Amazon? This is a question from Luis. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, yeah, I am in some in some sense. I'm I am assuming throughout that uh, the platform has commitment power, and as we can see in just a minute, the main difference uh, between two major business models I'm considering is exactly the degree of commitment power. And well, just as a preview, in another business model, uh, the platform or the intermediary would not have the ability to contract on price. Uh, but would have the ability to contract on information. So from that aspect, throughout the paper, the intermediary is assumed to have commitment power on information. And that's, that's a simplifying assumption, of course, and that's uh, sort of a way to model communication and information transmission. Of course, it's not the, the most reasonable or it's not the, the only way to model it. That's one way. Uh, but the, the main focus of this paper is to look at uh, different level of commitment power in terms of how influential the intermediary is in the product market, and in particular over prices. Hope that helps. Yes, okay. I guess we can postpone the discussion of what happens when sellers have market power for later on, when they're strong. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. And, uh, okay. So uh, one thing that I'd like to remark is that uh, this, this strong contracting model is exactly the retail model that I just mentioned uh, for the Amazon Vendor Central. Uh, because although Amazon Vendor Central acts as a retailer, in a strong contracting model, the intermediary is able to contract on everything. So the intermediary could just contract on the prices and information that it would have used when it, it already got all the products from the seller and acts as a retailer. So this strong contracting model in the background is going to be uh, an approximation of Amazon's vendor central. That's, uh, that's, that's mentioned in the introduction. Now the second business model uh, is going to correspond to the Amazon seller central. And this business model, uh, as, just, I, as I, would, I was just saying, uh, the intermediary is not able to contract on prices and can only contract on signals. So a mechanism here, again, asks the seller to report her cost, but given each reported cost, a mechanism can only specify the signal that's going to be provided to the buyer and the amount of transfer that the seller has to pay to the intermediary. IC and IR constraints are as usual, IC means that the seller wouldn't want to misreport, and IR means that every truthfully reporting seller earns at least zero. Now, uh, there is one thing interesting in this IC condition. If we look at the right-hand side, uh, that's the net profit of a seller whose true cost is C, and when she reports C prime, because she would have to pay tau of C prime, and the misreport is going to generate a demand, D of C prime, via signal. But at the end, it's the seller who gets to choose the price. So the seller, after signing a contract with the intermediary, would have to, sell, would have to solve a profit maximization by herself. And that profit maximization involves the seller's true cost, as opposed to the misreported cost. And that's going to be a, a key ingredient that creates some economic tension. Uh, that we have to uh, deal with later on. Okay, so uh, that's the weak contracting model. And the intermediary on the both business models is just going to maximize the expected revenue. All right, so, so that's basically the model. And a few words on uh, what's going on here is that, uh, first of all, the strong contracting model, uh, as I just pointed out, is basically modeling the Amazon vendor central retail model. And it turns out that it's just a standard one-dimensional uh, classical screening problem, just as in uh, Musa Rosen or uh, Meyerson or other classical papers. And the reason is that uh, as a retailer, the only private information that matters is the seller's production cost. And the only allocation that matters is the quantity purchased from the seller. Of course, there's going to be a continuation gain for that uh, intermediary after purchasing the good. But that continuation gain is a more of a standard persuasion or information design problem. So in a strong contracting model, the ability to contract on price 
simplifies the problem or uh, in other words, allows us to separate the problem into a classical one dimensional mechanism design problem and a classical uh, information design problem. The same thing is not true in the weak contracting model because in the weak contracting model, the seller gets to choose the price after uh, a signal is determined by the contract. In other words, the weak contracting model is a screening problem with an ex post non-contractual action, which is the price charged by the seller here. But in any case, a strong contracting model is mathematically a relaxed problem of the weak contracting model because there are just fewer constraints. We don't have to worry about prices in the strong contracting model, but we do have to worry about that in the weak contracting model. Okay, so that's the model. And now I'm going to uh, state my main results before going into the details of the uh, ideas of the proof, unless there are any uh, questions. Oh, no, okay. gone. Okay, so uh, before stating the result, let me define formally what I mean by outcome equivalence. I'll say that two business models are outcome equivalent if under any optimal mechanism of these two business models, the following are the same. The intermediary's revenue, expected revenue, the seller's interim profit, so that's a function of the realized cost, the buyer's expected surplus, and the ex post allocation of the good. Okay, so basically everything. And let me let R0 denote the usual revenue function as a function of quantity induced by the demand D0. And define this mu function as the following. So that mu of Q is the inverse of the virtual cost function evaluated at the inverse demand minus the marginal revenue at Q, okay? I'm calling this term the virtual markup at Q. The reason is if we first uh, for a moment suppose that there's no information rent so that the virtual cost equals to the actual, actual cost, then the inverse of uh, the virtual cost function equals to the identity function. And in that case, mu of Q becomes just an inverse demand minus mar marginal cost. And we know that this term is called the markup because if you remember this picture, here's the inverse demand, here's the marginal revenue. And if Q is here, we often said that the length of this segment is the markup charged by the monopoly whose cost is such that Q is an optimal quantity. Now, adding back the information rent, we have to readjust uh, what this demand looks like. And it's going to shift down. But in any case, the difference over here is going to be interpreted as the virtual markup because now we're adjusting the location of the inverse demand via this uh, virtual cost function. Okay, now let me keep this definition over here as a reminder and state my main result. The main result is that there exists an increasing function of lambda uh, with lambda zero being greater than or equal to zero such that the strong contracting model and the weak contracting model are outcome equivalent if and only if lambda mu, where mu is the virtual markup, is greater than or equal to zero. Now this means that if the mer virtual markup is large enough, then we'll have outcome equivalent. And how large? Well, remember in the benchmark case where there's no information rent, mu of Q is always no negative. Right, because the markup by, charged by a monopoly is always no negative. So when there's no information rent, the two business model is always equivalent. And lambda being increasing means that when the virtual, virtual cost function creates a distortion that's small enough, uh, we'll still have equivalence. Or alternatively, if we have a demand function that induces a small enough or uh, a low enough marginal cost, mar marginal revenue curve, uh, which means that it's, it's, uh, the demand function is more elastic, then the virtual, virtual markup is going to be large. Monotonicity of lambda means that the outcome equivalence is going to hold. Okay, so that's the main result. And now I'm going to spend some time to uh, basically sketch the main idea of the proof. Um, because of time, I won't be able to give the full proof today, 
And in particular, the functional lambda, I have a closed form for it, but it involves a little bit of derivation. So I'm not going to do that today. And instead, what I'm going to do is that I will impose a sufficient condition for lambda mu being greater than zero and uh, illustrate how in that situation can we construct uh, mechanisms in two business models that induce the same optimal revenue. Okay, so now let me go into the proof. Uh, first of all, for any C and for any D, let me denote PD of C as the optimal price of the seller whose cost is C when facing the demand D. If there are multiple optimal prices, let me just pick the largest one. And also remember, the CG is defined as the virtual cost, which is cost plus information rent. Uh, let me keep that here as a reminder. The first step of the proof is the usual revenue equivalence formula. It says that under any IC mechanism in both business models, the expected revenue can be written as a function of the allocation in that mechanism up to a constant. Now, this is just a necessary condition for IC, uh, and it's far away from sufficiency, partly because one, even in standard one-dimensional mechanism design problem, a revenue equivalence formula is not sufficient for IC. We have to have a monotonicity condition. And that's true for the strong contracting model, because as I said, the strong contracting model turns out to be a one-dimensional screening problem. So in the strong contracting model, this revenue equivalence formula plus the monotonicity condition of the quantity sold as a function of cause is going to be necessary and sufficient for IC. But that's not true in the weak contracting model. The weak contracting model in involves ex post non-contractual action. And in particular, there is some possibility of double deviation of the following form. A seller with true cost C may want to misreport and try to pretend to be cost C prime. And that misreport is going to generate a demand C prime. And yet the seller has true cost C. So the seller is going to price optimally according to the true cost rather than the misreported cost C prime. And this double deviation concern means that a simple monotonicity of the quantity over here is not going to be sufficient for IC. And some more complicated condition uh, for, for those who, who know this literature, uh, it's going to be some form of integral monotonicity condition that would be required there. But in any case, uh, that's a complicated condition and I'm not going to be able to get into the detail for today. So today I'm going to focus on the necessary condition and I'll tell you what the optimal mechanism looks like. Uh, and if there are interest in the end, I can talk about how to verify that the mechanism is indeed IC. Uh, one thing that I want to notice is that under the weak contracting model, if you look at the integrand of this expected revenue term, it, it summarizes the key tension in this model quite well. But there, there are actually two layers of, of distortions going on here. Uh, the first layer, oh, well, first let's notice that the integrand is the expected profit of the seller whose cost is replaced by the virtual cost and yet is still pricing optimally according to her true cost. Now this highlights two layers of distortion. One is the usual screening slash adverse selection distortion because we replace the cost by virtual cost, meaning that the intermediary faces a seller who has private information about cost. So it would have to pay some information rent to the seller that effectively increases the intermediary's margin of cost compared to the sellers. So that's the first layer. But the second layer over here is that at the end of the day in the weak contracting model, it's the seller who gets to choose what price to charge. So the price has always to be optimal with respect to the true cost as opposed to the marginal cost. So even if the intermediary has effectively a higher marginal cost, it cannot just force the seller to charge a price that reflects that marginal cost. The seller would have would also would always charge a price that reflects uh, her true marginal cost. And that highlights the second layer, more of a moral hazard tension uh, of this weak contracting model. And that's going to be the main problem that we're going to solve here. Okay, 
Now, because of that, the weak contracting model is not a standard mechanism design slash screening problem. So there's no off-the-shelf tools for us to solve that. Uh, the way I'm gonna do that is that I will guess an upper bound uh, for the expected revenue. I uh, kept the expected revenue over here as a reminder because I'm going to erase this soon. Uh, I guess an upper bound for the expected revenue and then I'll find a mechanism in the weak contracting model that gives the same amount of revenue as that upper bound. Okay, now let me try to derive that upper bound. First of all, uh, remember that this was stated uh, in the previous lemma. Under the strong contracting model, under any IC mechanism, the expected revenue looks like this. Now I dropped the constant because by the IR constraint, it means that the constant has to be zero. But under uh, the strong contracting model, the, expect the expected revenue for any IC mechanism looks like this. Now, whatever this thing is, if we look at the integrant, that's the profit of the seller whose cost is replaced by the virtual cost when facing the demand D and when drawing the price from distribution gamma. Whatever that is, it's gonna be bounded from above by the total surplus of the economy where I replace the cost by the virtual cost because the seller's profit is going to be bounded from above by the total surplus of the economy, all right? And I'm going to separate this integral. So rewrite that in the following way. And I'm going to call this thing R star. Now, one way to think of R star is the following outcome. Uh, we have something minus virtual cost times a probability of trade. So we can think of this outcome as inducing sell if and only if the buyer's value is above the virtual cost, meaning that we're selling to all the buyers with true value that's above the virtual cost. And we're going to sell the buyer at the price that equals to the conditional expected value, conditioning on value being above the virtual cost. Okay, now what I'm going to do now is to find a mechanism in the weak contracting model that gives expected revenue that equals to R star. That's going to solve the problem because remember the strong contracting model is a relaxed problem of the weak contracting model. So the, the optimal revenue under the weak contracting model is bounded from above by the optimal revenue under the strong contracting model, which is in turn bounded from above by R star. So if we can find some mechanism in the weak contracting model that gives expected revenue R star, then mean that, that means that this inequality chain must be all equalities, okay? So that's what I'm gonna do. Going back to the weak contracting model, or before going back to the weak contracting model, uh, notice that if we were in the strong contracting model, then we're pretty much done. We kind of know how to achieve this R star uh, by sort of the, the standard uh, persuasion argument or uh, the result in uh, a classical paper by Anderson Ronell, uh, because in the strong contracting model, the intermediary is able to choose price and information at the same time. So to achieve this outcome, the intermediary can simply just offer a binary signal that tells the buyer whether or not his value is above or below the virtual cost, and then force the seller to charge a price that equals to the interim expected value condition uh, condition on value being above the virtual cost. And that way we can induce the desired outcome. But that's not true for the weak contracting model because price is not contractable. And in particular, it may not be to the seller's interest to sell the product at a price that equals to the interim expected value condition on being, value being above the virtual cost. When the seller's true cost is C as opposed to the virtual cost to be G of C. So in order to induce the seller to price in that way, uh, we have to do something else. In any case, the goal here is to find an ICIR mechanism, D star tau star in the weak contracting model, such that for every seller, she would sell to the buyer if and only if the buyer's true value is above the virtual cost and she would sell to the buyer, buyer at price uh, that equals to the expected value of V, condition on V being above the virtual cost. Okay, so now I'm going to construct this mechanism, V star tau star. 
uh, before that, and here's the sufficient condition that I mentioned that I'll impose for this talk, uh, just as a simplifying condition. I'm going to assume that phi g is point-wise below the optimal price under the prior. And this would imply that this lambda mu uh, condition in the, in the statement of the theorem is always non-negative. Okay, and now I'm going to construct the mechanism. Uh, the transfer is going to be pinned down by the revenue equivalence formula. So I'll just focus on constructing a mapping from the report caused to a mean preserving contraction of the prior, which I will call D star. Let me draw the prior over here first. For any report C, the C is here, and the virtual cost is here. Define V of C as the targeted price, which is uh, the expected value, conditional value being above the virtual cost. So it's here. And now I'm going to draw uh, the mean preserving contraction, D star of C, as the following, and I'll color that in blue. And it's actually quite simple. For every value that's below the virtual cost, I'm going to keep that distribution the same as the prior. And for every value that's above the virtual cost, I'm simply just going to concentrate all the probability weights at V of C. And here's the formal, and that's D star. And here's a formal definition of it, in case someone is wondering. Uh, but one important feature of this D star is that because of the definition of V of C, we know that the area of these two regions are going to be the same. And this would imply that D star is indeed a mean preserving contraction of D zero. Furthermore, it turns out that it's indeed optimal for the seller with cost C to charge a price at V of C. Because first of all, remember I had this assumption that the optimal price under the prior is above the virtual cost. So the optimal price is going to be somewhere here. And second, remember I had this assumption where uh, the prior demand induces a decreasing marginal revenue curve. And that when translated to profit function as a function of price would mean that the profit function is single peak like this. And of course the peak is going to be at here, which is to the right of the virtual cost by right, this assumption. And this means that under the prior, charging any prices below the virtual cost is going to give less of a profit than charging a price that, and charging a price at the virtual cost. But that's not just under the prior. D star looks exactly the same as the prior when the value is below the virtual cost. So the profit function under D star, which is in blue here, is going to look exactly the same as that of the prior, which means Charging any prices below the virtual cost is going to give less of a profit than charging a price at the virtual cost under D star. But virtual cost is not an optimal price either because we can see from this demand, we can always increase price without changing quantity until we get this point V. In terms of profit function, it means that the profit function is going to keep increasing linearly until we get to the point V of C and then drop to zero. Now from this profit function, we can see that the optimal price of the seller with cost C is indeed V of C. Now, why is this useful? Well, it means that under D star of C, the buyer is going to buy if and only if value is above V and they're going to buy exactly at price V of C. That's the desired outcome we want to attain. So let me keep this D star and move it up I use the revenue equivalence formula to back out the transfer. Here's the optimal mechanism. And that mechanism attains revenue R star. Now remember, the proof is not done yet because I have to check that this mechanism is indeed incentive compatible. Uh, I might not be able to go through that today. And, but if there are interest in doing a Q&A session, I'd be happy to talk about that. Okay, uh, so basically, what happens here is that there's a screening cost, which effectively uh, boosts the intermediary's marginal cost so that it's higher. So the intermediary would prefer a higher price than the seller does. Under a strong contracting model, the intermediary can just force the seller to charge whatever price that it desires. 
But that's not true under the weak contracting model. Under the weak contracting model, the intermediary has to incentivize the seller using the information provided to the buyer. And under the sufficient condition that I gave, uh, the derivation that we just saw means that by fully revealing the value V to the buyer, when V is below the virtual cost, that's going to give the right incentive to incentivize the seller to price in the right way. And in general, uh, whenever the virtual markups are large enough, there are going to be enough of rooms for us to play around with the information in a similar way as we just saw, uh, so that the intermediary can incentivize the seller to price in the desired way. Okay, now one last thing uh, before concluding is that uh, one implication of this outcome equivalence result is that for, for the intermediaries, uh, at least in this model, they have no strict preference over a particular business model as long as gains from trade, well, as long as the uh, virtual markups are large enough. Uh, an interesting anecdote is that throughout the past decade, uh, the seller central of Amazon has grown from 26% to 52%. Uh, so basically now Amazon is half and half between two business models. And one last word about business models in between. Uh, the two business models, the strong contracting and weak contracting models are quite strong, uh, quite strong of an assumption. One allows full contracting ability, one allows none of the contracting ability on the pro in the product market. But equivalence result means that any other business models in between are also going to be equivalent uh, when the two extremes are equivalent. Okay, and, and that's basically I have to say for today. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So let's hear from Daniele Condorelli from the University of Warwick, who's discussing this paper today. Daniele. Hi, uh, hello everyone, and uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, it's been a while I had in mind to look at the Kai's work, and so this uh, gave me uh, a good opportunity to do it. Okay, so uh, I've been asked to keep it uh, non mathematical, and uh, with pleasure I will do that. Kai has been very clear on explaining uh, um, what mathematics drive the results. So let me try to. Uh, give you an explanation uh, uh, without uh, hopefully embarrassing myself, uh, trivializing too much. And uh, so I'll keep the, um, the perspective of, uh, of uh, theory here as opposed to thinking about platforms and having more of an applied uh, uh, stance. So, so what this uh, result is about, this is a, a, a sort of a, a neutrality results. Uh, we know neutrality results are central uh, in economics, uh, neutrality of money, the neutrality of equity debit financing in the Modigliani Miller theorem, and, uh, and of course, uh, the neutrality of the payment rule uh, in mechanism design or uh, revenue equivalence, so called. So, uh, all, these, all these equivalence results are important because uh, they allow sense to, uh, uh, to, to see that uh, in, in a certain idealized environment, certain uh, specific um, phenomenon are not the cause uh, of, uh, in this case, uh, 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 the outcomes of our model. Okay, and so this allows us to think about, uh, I don't know, other frictions that might uh, lead to in fact uh, the business model to matter, like you would think uh, uh, like uh, neo keynesian models would make money no short term if you want, or you may uh, take the approach that let's forget about the business model and let's try to think about uh, more important uh, aspects. Uh, and, and this is what a lot of uh, applied theory, applied mechanism design does by uh, saying, okay, let's focus on the, on the outcome as opposed to then to the payment rule, okay? Now, uh, of course, uh, uh, this paper is not, does not make such a, a grand claim, I would say, because it's still uh, uh, needs problems easily and, and maybe, um, and maybe it requires some thought, and I'll say a few words later, but, but it, it allows us to, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, 
uh, sort of uh, at least what what tells me is how to uh, abstract away a little bit from uh, from the aspects of uh, uh, information here okay and uh, and uh, so i think there's uh, so when you want to think about, uh, so so the way i think about this is the following there's there's the uh, the seller there's this intermediary and there's the buyer the buyer really here plays a very little role in a sense so th there are two informed parties the seller and the intermediary and what you see is that uh, uh, the intermediary here is a monopolistic power in the sense that if the intermediary do not consent to a contract of whatever sort uh, with the seller then there's no sale okay because the seller has no access to the buyer okay so this monopolistic buy this monopolistic uh, um, sort of control plus uh, information on the two sides is going to tell me that uh, uh, rents will will stay the same okay so the information rent of the seller uh, will have to be there it cannot be um, attracted away and so the remaining will stay with the intermediary because of course the buyer is not going to make any money because there is no information here okay so so uh, so, so in this sense uh, and, and i think this is natural in, in equivalence theory you can see into you sorry they they are they the, I need to open. I, I'll walk with you. So, so it, it's natural, intuitively, that uh, that you would expect this result, as in, uh, in in a sense, as in neutrality of money. But it's not at all obvious on how you would uh, how you would show. Uh, now, uh, why I said that maybe uh, uh, there, there's still some work to do. So I think uh, uh, one, this is a, this is a potentially larger problem. You might think, or at least when I think about it, the more natural assumption for me is to think that the intermediary is more informed um, than the seller, but no more informed than the buyer often okay and when i think about amazon okay amazon might know about my tastes more than the seller but i will still uh, having some information rent vis-a-vis -vis amazon if i need the product or if i don't need it and so forth so when you think about this situation and then you look at this two quantum model then i think you see that the, there is a difference okay because now the value of the information is going to be different to the intermediary than it is uh, to the seller. So if the intermediary buys from, uh, from the seller in order to resell, he will face first uh, uh, an asymmetric information problem with the seller, okay? Then once he has bought, he will face another information problem, asymmetric information problem of selling with the buyer, okay? So you will have this double marginalization uh, uh, thing here. However, if the intermediary sells the information, information to the at that point you different problem here in which the seller the buyer is fully informed but as asymmetric information about the cost of the buyer about the cost of the seller and the seller has uh, now uh, information about the value of the buyer but as the information provided by the intermediary okay so in my conjecture here you would not, not observe uh, the same equivalency so i think that uh, that needs to be uh, studied here, but uh, this paper, in a sense, uh, makes progress along one direction and and one point. As I said, it might be intuitive, but uh, as we have seen from the slide, is uh, not at all obvious. So well done, and I have sent other minor detail come to uh, comment to Kai directly without discussing them here. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Daniele. Um, so uh, what we can do is to give Kai the opportunity to maybe react uh, to Daniele's comments. And then I have one question holding in the chat, and then we can open up the Q&A session. Kai, do you yeah. want to react? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. OK, uh, so uh, perhaps very quickly, uh, and thank you, Daniel, for, for the comments that you sent and, and you mentioned today. Uh, 
And I apologize that I, I lost you for about 30 seconds there. So I might send you an email asking clarifying questions, but uh, based on my understanding, I think you are, uh, I, I appreciate the interpretation of, uh, of neutrality result. And on the, on the broader sense, I think uh, one of my agenda is to, is to look at that kind of neutrality in similar context. Um, this paper doesn't make the grand claim that says that all the business models are neutral, uh, but I think you're right pointing out that the equivalence results stated here, uh, even though we don't interpret that in the literal sense that Amazon doesn't care about business model, uh, it allows uh, modelers or economists to think about business models by abstracting away some uh, parts that are that are equivalent. And, and so now we can think more clear about, for example, how, how useful and, and how, how, how important is, the, uh, is uh, the cost of being a retailer, perhaps inventory cost, shipping cost, and things like that. Uh, that's going to be to uh, uh, one order more important than the informational uh, factors because, uh, because of the result that we saw in this paper. And I agree uh, entirely that it is quite a consumption that the buyer doesn't have any private information over here in the model. And uh, that may or may not break the equivalence result in general. I'm still working on that. And that's, that's in fact some, some work in progress. And, and thank you for pointing that out. Uh, but one thing I can say is that I have another a related paper, which is basically uh, similar to this. But now, instead of assuming that the buyer doesn't know anything and has to learn things from a signal, there the buyer knows everything about the value and the intermediary is going to inform the seller about what the buyer's value is. And combining the results of the, the two papers together, we can see that whenever the equivalence result hold here, uh, the equivalence result is going to hold there and the amount of revenue is going to be the same. So this kind of means that, well, as a platform, you have two kinds of tools. One is through informing the buyer, through information manipulation in the, in the product market by informing the buyer. Uh, the other is sort of by selling information about the buyer to the product seller. And these two are going to be equivalent um, if the equivalence result holds here. And that relies on additional results in my other paper. And, and I'll be happy to talk more about that uh, offline. But, but thank you very much for the comments there. They're very helpful. Thank you.